aside here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Such an awesome presence of the Lord in the house tonight. Haven't you missed that? Those that haven't been able to gather, many of us, uh, we got to gather Sunday. And, uh, those in your homes, worship him. He shows up. He inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to go into another form of worship and worship in our giving. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't outgive God. Sunday when uh, Pastor called ushers up, uh, something come to my mind. The Lord began to speak to me. When you sow into the kingdom of God in good ground, in a, in a church that is good ground, when people come here, they receive salvation, they receive healing, deliverance, victory. So you're not just sowing your finances when you sow into the kingdom of God. And you reap what you sow. So when you sow into the kingdom of God, you're, you're sowing into lives that, that you may not even be aware of. And as you sow, you reap that back. Salvation, healing, deliverance, victory. So you're not just giving your money. You're sowing into the kingdom of God. And, and God has everything that we need. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I worship you that you give us an opportunity to give back unto you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, and we trust you, God. Lord, that you would, Lord, meet our needs, God, as we sow into the field, God, that you've given us, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for every blessing. I speak a blessing over the giver tonight. I declare it. I rebuke the devourer in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare victory over sin, over sickness, over disease. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I praise you and I worship you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Those online, you can give. Uh, there's a 662 200 9867. You can text give to that and follow your instructions. And uh, you can give that way. You can also mail it to the church. Uh, they have that on the screen also for your availability and those in the service of March. In Jesus' name.
In the year 1271 AD, the Emperor Kublai Khan asked the explorer Marco Polo to bring 100 missionaries from Europe to teach Christianity to his people. Sadly, those missionaries never came. The glorious light of the gospel never had the opportunity to shine. The Khan and his people turned to Buddhism and all of Asia descended into the depths of idolatry. The 50 countries of Asia constitute 60% of the world's entire population. More than 4.5 billion souls live on this one continent alone, and all throughout Asia you'll find people praying to idols which have no eyes to see nor ears to hear their prayers. Asia's bright exception has been the country of the Philippines, where a tremendous apostolic revival has been birthed. The vision God gave us for the Philippines mission has three mandates. First, we must develop many more national workers to take the gospel to their own people. This has been the mission propelling the Apostolic Bible College of the Philippines since 2010. Today, many ABC graduates are actively involved in ministry. Second, we must establish many more churches in the Philippines. By God's grace, we have seen the number of our churches more than triple over the past decade. And third, as the work matures, we must begin sending missionaries out of the Philippines to reach Asia and the rest of the world. By God's grace and with your help, all of these things have begun to come to pass. Workers and ministers continue to be trained New churches are being established and the ALJC Philippines mission is beginning to take the gospel beyond its borders. In 2012, we commissioned our first Filipino missionaries to Melbourne, Australia. That work has taken root and is now beginning to blossom. In 2017, an exciting new work opened up in Hong Kong, China. Recently, we've gotten requests from people in Japan and Malaysia for someone to come and start works in those countries. I see a unique opportunity for the Philippines to become a base of operations for reaching Asia with the gospel. The needs in Asia vary. Not every mission field needs or is ready for a full-time resident missionary. Countries that have existing apostolic works would be greatly benefited by regular visits from seasoned ministers a few times a year. Nations where new works are springing up will need more frequent visits. Some places like Hong Kong would benefit greatly from a full-time resident missionary. In many countries of Asia, Christianity is despised and or illegal. Persecution is a real problem in a big chunk of Asia and the Middle East. In these places, people worship in secret and missions work is done undercover. But regardless of the danger or the cost, everyone needs to hear the gospel. Here in the Philippines, there's always room for more hands to help in the Lord's work. We're looking for people who are willing to work wherever there's a need. 
You and I can only imagine how different things would be today if missionaries would have answered that call seven and one half centuries ago. Today, the call for missionaries to work in Asia is going out once again. The Lord is doing great things here. We've got a great team here. We'd love to have you come work with us. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Welcome to all those of you that are here with us. Amen. It's, it's good to see you. I hope we're all getting back into the habit of coming to the house of the Lord. And to all of those of you that are watching online, God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, we are in prayer for you and hopeful that we can all be together very soon. And uh, we're looking forward, of course, to a great weekend. But tonight, we have a very special treat for Bethlehem Church, and that is to have uh, our dear friend, missionary Mark Namey with us from uh, the Philippines and Hong Kong. And Brother Naomi, welcome to Bethlehem Church. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, we thank you for what you're doing for the kingdom of God. And I want you to know that Bethlehem Church loves you and we appreciate your ministry. We've been looking forward to you coming and we're thankful that you're here. Brother Naomi was supposed to be with us, uh, was it last week? Yeah. Last week or the week before. And uh, because of all the, the, the change in schedule, uh, we thought we weren't going to get to have him, but God blessed us, and uh, he's with us tonight. So let's make B Brother Naomi welcome and, uh, to Bethlehem Church. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Vasquez. I uh, appreciate so very much the opportunity to, uh, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I want to, before we go any farther, just uh, say thank you to Bethlehem Church. Uh, we love and appreciate you so very much. Appreciate your giving and your support uh, for the for world missions in general and for the Philippines and, and Asia works in particular. Uh, it's, it's a blessing to be a partner with you in world missions. Amen. So, Brother Naomi, if, if you will, if you can tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where you're from, maybe how you and Sister Naomi met and how you became introduced uh, to the Apostolic Church. Okay, great. Um, First of all, I was born in a little town in southeast Washington by the name of Walla Walla. Uh, so it's a town they love so much they named it twice. Uh, uh, so uh, I was there till uh, college and in uh, uh, 1976, I moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado to attend uh, the Colorado College. And it was, it was while I was there that I first heard the gospel as we know it and uh, totally uh, it transformed my life, um, and it's also when I met my, uh, my precious wife, Deborah, in church. A um, little background, I, I didn't obviously grow up in church. I'd never really heard about Pentecost at all. I didn't, in fact, I'd never even heard of speaking in tongues until I was 20 years old, and it fascinated me uh, that such a thing was in the Bible and that uh, it was an experience for us today, so that that really caught my attention. But uh, make a long story short, uh, my life was a mess. I was very far from God. Um, I was, a, as I was telling the pastor, I was a big time sinner and a small time drug dealer. And uh, uh, just had, my life got to a point where it was just spinning out of control. Uh, don't have time really to go into all the details, but suffice it to say, God just began to draw me. Uh, and I saw that. Uh, the only hope I really had of turning things around, uh, I thought I'd give God a chance. And so one, one day, uh, after repeated invitations, I finally gave in and went to that apostolic church. And my first impression was not favorable. Uh, the, the building itself was not in good repair, but the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and I just felt like if, if God dwells in humility, maybe I'll find him in this place. 
And then I walked into the uh, congregation and you know, I saw a bunch of folks that looked like you and I thought, man, am I ever out of place. And then they began to worship and uh, friend, they were, you know, they were, they were having a, a big time and I thought, oh my, my Lord, I, if I get out of this place alive, I'll never come back. <laughs> But it began to sort, you all know what I'm talking about, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> but it, uh, all, while all that was going on, uh, God was dealing with me on the inside. And I'll never forget, the, the pastor began to preach, and it was as though he was, he was reading my life story. And I got so angry with my friend that invited me to church, I literally hit him in the ribs in the middle of the church service, hurt him. I mean, I hit him hard. And he looked, and I'll never forget the look on his face, like, ouch, why'd you do that? And, and I looked at him, and I didn't say the words. I just mouthed him, you told him. Because we were in church. I wasn't going to yell it. I didn't mind hitting him, but I wasn't going to yell. Uh, and, he, and then he threw his hands up, and he said, no. And then right then, that moment, I realized, well, if Tom didn't tell the preacher my life story, it must have been God. So I just, I don't remember much else about the service. I think angels carried me down to the altar, or I floated, or something. It just... I just, but I remember just hitting the ground uh, in front of the front of the church and just breaking down. Uh, just uh, it was so it was there. So my conversion was first time I was ever in an apostolic church. Uh, I repented of my sins. Some uh, somebody told me I needed to be baptized. I said fine, but but I'll never forget uh, Pastor Vasquez. Was this this uh, goes to some of the other questions on here. The moment I received the Holy Ghost, I also got the Holy Ghost that night. So sequence was, fell on my face, just begged God to forgive me, tears flowing. Uh, somebody came, and the church began to gather around behind me. And then I, I remember saying distinctly, right before I got the Holy Ghost, I said, God, if this Holy Ghost is real, please give it to me tonight. Because I don't know if I could, if, it, if I don't get it tonight, I don't know if I could ever come back. And then I, then I remember telling God, Lord, I'll go anywhere. Careful what you tell God. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll face anybody. And I didn't even know what this meant. But I said, I'll even preach this gospel if you want me to. And immediately I received the Holy Ghost. And I was baptized that night. So, so I, I, got the, uh, I got the full package in one night. Um, and I know it doesn't work like that for everybody, but I was such a mess if, if, you know, that I needed... Yeah, I needed something like that. So how long was it until you felt your call to the ministry? Was it immediately that night? Before I got the Holy Ghost. I mean, it was, I, I, I actually knew I was called to ministry just right then. Yeah. But it was a long time developing, but that's, that's, that, that's when I knew. So, so from, from that point when you became very active in ministry, what were some of the roles that you fulfilled, some of the, uh, some of the places you went maybe? And what did you do with your ministry before you got involved great, in missions? Great question. Uh, so you've got to understand, at that point, I, I knew nothing about the Bible. I, I was 20 years old. I, was, I, w I knew God had done something amazing in my life and immediately began to tell all my friends back at school what had happened. Of course, it created quite a stir, and, and I got all kinds of religious uh, opposition. And, and I didn't really understand it. I thought everybody would be happy. I got converted. But... but uh, it's, and some were, but, but you know, there, there was this crazy mixed response. Um, but because I didn't know how to answer people's questions, it drove me to study the Bible and ask people you know, that, that were ahead of me in Christ uh, in the apostolic faith, how, you know, how do you answer this? How do you, know, you, you know, I'm hearing this. So, so thankfully, we had a good group of young people that uh, surrounded me from day one. And that was probably the key to my staying in the church is that they, you know, I was there on a college campus. It was kind of an anti-God sort of setting. Um, but as far as what did I do, um, it, that kind of got me started in ministry. Well, my pastor was wise. He, he knew better than to give me a microphone or anything. Um, and, uh, and, and he was very patient. Um, but I, I never got any pulpit opportunities uh, for 11, first 11 years I was in, in, in the church, but uh, I got really excited about teaching Bible studies. One of the, uh, the assistant pastor, one of the ministers there, uh, took me under his wing. He basically just grabbed me up one day and said, you're coming with me. Uh, and I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to uh, teach a Bible study. And I said, that sounds cool. So he had the, the search for truth chart, 
and, and, and I'll never forget it. Uh, we went to this family's home. They had, it was lesson number one. They were just some contacts that he, had, that he had developed. And I watched as he shared the word of God with them. And the most amazing thing happened. They began to, I, I saw tears beginning to flow. I saw people beginning to ask questions like, what do I need to do to get right with God? And, and, and I watched as, as Brother Payne just very gracefully began to explain to them the plan of salvation. And, and right there in their living room, people repenting. Uh, they didn't get the Holy Ghost that night, but those foot people did come to church and they got baptized and, and they got established in the church. They eventually did get, all get the Holy Ghost. And that, uh, that was an amazing experience. And then Brother Payne said to me, he says, all right, so he's, he said, you've been through lesson one, now you, you need to find somebody to teach lesson one to. And I said, uh, but, 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 but I, don't know the, I don't know the Bible. He says, but you know lesson one. He said, that's all you need to know. So, so he just threw me in the deep end. So I started teaching Bible studies, and that was, uh, it's my first love as far as ministry. Um, and it was a way I got to kind of scratch my itch for, uh, for sharing the gospel with people. And I love it to this day. It's a way you can, um, uh, there's just nothing like it. You know, the, just the excitement of, of, of sharing the word of God in people's homes. Can I interject there yeah. that if, that Brother Namie's Facebook page has, uh, I, I saw it today as a matter of fact, I was doing a little research on you. Yeah. Yeah. And he has, he has a couple of videos on his Facebook page about how to teach Search for Truth. Yeah, actually there's three posted there now. Awesome. So we're doing a series with some, some brothers in Kenya now who, who wanted some, some training on how to teach Search for Truth. Awesome. So if you're, we, we, most of us here, we use a, a very similar Bible. So we use exploring God's word. That's yeah, similar. Basically the same as search for truth. But if you're interested, uh, go to Brother Namie's Facebook page and watch the videos about learning how to teach a Bible study. Now, um, we don't have all preachers here. We have some preachers here, but I will, and, and this is not directed necessarily at them because we got some great ministers in our church that love souls, but uh, probably not wise to become a pastor and start being a missionary unless you can teach a Bible study, is it? It's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, so how did you become involved? Now, you pastored in Colorado. I did. For a while. Yes. And then how did you transition from that to world missions? It's actually a story that unfolds over a long period of time. And as I look back, you, and I think many of us can, can relate to that. You can see the hand. The older that you get, you see the hand of God at work. Uh, way back in your life when you didn't even, didn't even realize at the time what was going on. Um, so I got uh, saved in 1978, um, began to teach Bible studies almost immediately. Um, in 1981, I <clears throat> uh, met a man from the country of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's a small island, group of islands in the Caribbean. And he was, a, uh, he was in the Army. He was a soldier in the Army. He had just gotten stationed in Colorado Springs. We became fast friends. And, I've, and he was a fairly new convert to the apostolic faith, very zealous for souls. And we became, like I said, really good friends. So he began to tell me a lot about his country and his people. And in the process of time, I learned that there was this entire nation that he was from, that he had a tremendous burden for, that there was no apostolic church, not a single church in the entire country. And he had this burden to take the gospel back to his people because he'd gotten saved in Fort Riley Kansas uh, after he'd gotten to America while he was a soldier, and he just wanted to go back. And so he and I used to talk about it. He, I, mean, I was listening to him in, 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 about his burden, and over the process of time, his burden kind of jumped on me. And one day, uh, unbeknownst to either one of us, my wife, Sister Naomi, who wishes she was here, by the way, she sends her regards. Uh, our daughter has uh, a medical appointment today and another one tomorrow that uh, precluded her from being here, but she sends her, her, uh, her regards to y'all. But anyway, she, she went out and bought plane tickets for us to visit the country of St. Vincent. Now, this was 1993. And so, we, so Brother Eric Rodriguez and myself uh, got on an airplane and spent nine days in, in this, this is not the Philippines, but this all leads to it. So we, we spent nine days in the country of St. Vincent. It was like the Book of Acts was open, uh, Brother Vasquez. We, uh, I'd never seen anything like it. Actually, uh, since then, I've seen God do some similar things, but it, up to that point, I'd never seen it. Uh, we, uh, we, we're just, neither one of us had much experience in ministry other than teaching Bible studies. We weren't 
pulpit preachers. We were just kind of young, uh, zealous people that didn't know a whole lot better. Uh, but we got invited to preach in one of their local churches, uh, one of the people that knew Brother Rodriguez from, from years before. And we both took about 15, 20 minutes preaching. And when we were finished, people began to worship. Everybody was rejoicing. And there were about a small church, maybe they're 25 or 30. And to my recollection, pretty much all of them were speaking in tongues. I thought, wow, Pentecostal church here. Come to find out later, I found out that none of them had ever experienced the Holy Ghost before. Just, you know, wow. You know, it was just, to me, it just felt like a good church service. Where everybody said, but, but it was a first time Holy Ghost experience for, for all of them. And then that afternoon, we were, that very same afternoon, we were invited by a little old man uh, who, who was in the service to come to pray for his wife, who was blind. She had, she had diabetes had, had uh, uh, w- w- gripped her body, and she lost her sight. And uh, so we went to her house that afternoon and began to talk to her and, 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 uh, and, and the elder brother there and uh, asked first about the Holy Ghost and... Uh, the lady had heard about it. The man had, was, had been in that service this morning, and uh, so he'd had a touch of it already. And uh, Brother Rodriguez asked the, the lady whether she'd like to receive the Holy Ghost, and she says yes. And so she sit, she's sitting in this chair, this little tiny room that's, well, one-third of the size of this, of this platform. The whole house is maybe half the size of this platform. And she, she leaned back in that in that chair, and, I, and uh, she began, we prayed for it, we laid hands, and she began to speak in tongues, and in a few minutes, she opened up her eyes, and she began to shout, I can see, I can see, praise God, I can see. And we looked up, we looked up, and there's all these faces looking in the, in the windows, because we've been making so much noise, the, the, the neighborhoods are, everybody in the neighborhood's gathering, there's eyes and faces looking in the windows. And, and then Brother Rodriguez turned to the little old man, he must have been about 80, I think his name was Edwards, and he said, do you want to receive this Holy Ghost too? And he said, he just shook his head like that. And, he, and so he got up and he began to, you know, dance like this in the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost fell on him. So, uh, you know, let's make a long story short. Uh, so several got the Holy Ghost that morning, God uh, did a miracle of healing that night. We were at another church service in a different place that night. May- maybe 30, 40 more got the Holy Ghost. The next morning, there were people lined up outside of our, the, place, the house where we slept waiting for us to pray for them. They brought the sick and people who wanted prayer, demons cast out. It was like, it was like to me, I never experienced anything like that. It was like the book of Acts was open. So, so that was 1993. And so uh, suffice it to say that I felt like God had, had confirmed that it was his will for us to go there. So the, uh, within uh, a few months, we, I came back home, uh, quit, quit our job, sold our uh, house, uh, packed up our possessions, and we moved. And we ended up spending a, a year in St. Vincent. Now, halfway through it, I'm getting to the Philippines. So about halfway through that first year that we were there, we, we expected we were going to be there the rest of our lives. You know, we'd, I, I, qu- I quit a good paying job. I, you know, we're, we're there. We'd make the sacrifice. But God began to deal with us about returning back to the United States. And I didn't like it. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with God. My, Deborah, poor thing, she's having nightly dreams. She ended up having 21 dreams in 21 nights. And each one of them was... Uh, telling a story of another work that God had for us that wasn't there. And I'm like, no, God, this, this doesn't work like this. We sacrifice, we're here, you know, I'm content, things are happening. I just couldn't figure it out. I can, you know, how all that could be happening and God want us to move. But what, to make, so that's kind of how the story began to unfold. So we end up coming back to America, but God put something in us about missions. We, we always kind of knew that probably again, um, you know, God would open another door. So when we came back to, to uh, America, I got my old job back at one third the pay that I was making previously. But but uh, God is good; it built up, it built back up over time. But 
But uh, uh, we started first a church in Salida, Colorado. We were there for three and a half years. Then we turned that over to another man, and we started to work in Colorado Springs. We were there nine and a half years. And about uh, seven years into that, God began to prepare us just in little ways, that, uh, letting us know that it was probably his will for us to, that, that he had some change. And then one day, uh, while we're praying and fasting about that, I got a call from, from Bishop uh, M.L. Walls asking, uh, telling us about the opportunity, the opening in the Philippines, and that the ALJC had been looking for a missionary, and we would be interested in going with him to check it out. So that was 2006. Amen. So um, you, you touched on a lot of the questions I was going to ask. Yeah. And so, so what I do want to say, I do want to ask is, who were some of your biggest influences in ministry, missions work, et cetera? Wow. Um, number one, my pastor. Uh, uh, first, uh, we, uh, been blessed to have a few pa great pastors over the course of the years, but uh, Reverend Tom Johnson, my first pastor, who got us so solidly grounded in the apostolic faith. Um, I'd have to give him first honors as far as that. Uh, Brother Rodriguez and, and his, his zeal for, for wanting to reach his people would be another. Um, but there have been a number of others along the way. Amen. So um, how did you know that you were called to the mission field, to be a missionary? And then how did you know that the Philippines was the right place to go? That's a, that's, those are really two great questions. And I think there's, there's a lot of people that are asking the same, same kind of questions. Uh, you know, I feel like maybe God is calling them, and, um, but not knowing exactly, you know, wh uh, or maybe he's preparing them. Um, so let me just talk about the preparation process. If you feel a call to ministry, but maybe it isn't, it hasn't yet become super clear or specific. Uh, maybe it's missions. Maybe it's something else. Um, don't wait. Spend this time now preparing yourself. Um, learn the word of God. Put you, get busy around the church. Teach Bible studies. Win souls. Uh, don't wait for some future manifestate great manifestation of, of the will of God in your life because the will of God is right now. Uh, it, so, so put yourself to work now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love teaching the Bible studies. And, you know, for, for many years we taught four or five Bible studies a week. And it's addicting. Um, you know, just, just winning souls is, 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 uh, is super addicting. Um, so how did, it, how, did it, how did it open up? Well, one day it'll just unfold. Um, how does the call of God manifest itself to us? It's real simple. It manifests as a need. So rather than worrying about what, you know, what God is calling you to, just open your eyes and look around you. What needs do you see right now today around you that you can meet? What needs are, do you see that you can meet? Because the need is the call. God will manifest his call to you by showing you a need that needs to be fulfilled. And if you see a need and you can fill it, God's probably calling you to feed that need. If, so well, now it's always a good idea to, to bounce your feelings off your pastor, but that's, that's in general how, how I think it always manifests. It, so remember that first prayer, God will go anywhere, God will do anything, God will face anybody. Just give me the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, I'll preach this gospel. So when the need opened up, I'd already, I'd already told God I would go anywhere. So be careful what you pray. Yeah. So, so Bishop Walls, you said it was 2006? 2006, I got the call to go to the Philippines for the first time. Okay. And so you visited, you visited I did. the Philippines. Went to a conference. And then, and then from there, I was hooked. The, the, uh, you're addicted to the Philippines. It, it ruined me. It yeah. ruined me. They just... They're the sweetest people in all the world. And, uh, but God actually confirmed something. So in the midst of that service, another just beautiful thing, uh, you, you know, I'm thick-headed. I don't know about any of you, but, but I'm kind of dense. My wife was here. She'd be shouting amen. Um, and so 
I made a deal with God years ago, I, I, and I, I pray this way. I said, God, I'll do anything, but you've got to speak to me clearly. Speak to me in a way that I know that I've heard from you. And that's, I think that's a fair prayer. I, I don't want to be in the dark. I, I, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Just talk to me in a way that I can know it's your voice. And so uh, there have been a, a series of events that's happened in our life where God has just honored that prayer so beautifully. Um, and so uh, while we were still in St. Vincent, part of the process of knowing that it was time for us to come back is my wife had had 21 dreams, but I hadn't had any. So I finally got kind of fed up. I, I went to God on the morning of the 22nd day, and I said, God, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm fighting against this. I've already told you I, I, I'm willing to stay here for the rest of my life, um, and, and, and I don't understand what you're doing here. And I, and I realize, though, that what you're, what you're saying through my wife, it feels like it's really your voice, but I need to hear from you myself. I said, God, I'm, I'm the leader of this home. I need to hear from you myself. So that night... On night 22, God gave me one dream. And in that dream, there were several scenes. And I realized this was like uh, a panorama of, of my life. This, this doesn't happen often. This once this has happened in my life. But God, like, showed me, here's going to be some major stages in your life. That was in 1995 as we're preparing to come back to America. Well... In 2006, when I was in the Philippines, for the first night I was there after preaching, we're watching five or 600 people worship, many receiving the Holy Ghost. I felt God to speak to me and say, look up. And I just raised my eyes. And as I did, I hadn't thought about this dream in, in years. God showed me a, the, la, the final scene in that dream, which was a, a well-plowed field and me wearing overalls. So, and uh, basically with seeds in my hand, showing me that this is the place I'm supposed to plant. So, so uh, when it comes to the distinct will of God, I think you know, God doesn't speak to everybody the same way, but he knows how to speak to you. And he may not speak to you the same way he spoke, he's, you know, he spoke to us, but, but he knows how to get your attention. So now, now you're transitioning to living in Asia. Yeah. Uh, totally different culture. Uh, what, what was the biggest part of the transition that maybe you struggled with? How did you overcome it? And then someone wants to know, when you're there, what do you miss about here? And when you're here, what do you miss about Those there? Those are all great questions. All right, so let's talk first of all about, about you know, the differences um, and, and the kinds of struggles that you face. I put them in, in like three categories. There are things that are in the natural realm. These are things like, you know you're moving to a, to a different country, you know the culture's different, you know the language is gonna be, you have to learn the language or, or figure that out, you know, uh, figure out ways to communicate. Uh, you, you anticipate that you're gonna have to learn all the different ways of doing things. I mean, th they don't even pay bills the way that we do. I mean. We, it's getting more modern now, but, you know, we, we were used to, like, writing out a check, putting it in an envelope, putting a stamp on it. You know, that's how you pay your utility bills or whatever. They don't do that there. Um, you, you know, the mail system hardly is very inefficient, and people don't, don't uh, think about using that. They all, they have little payment centers. So you go into, like, a shopping mall, and you bring your bill in, and you pay it right there at the mall. And, you know, so we had to, but we didn't know that. There's a thousand little things like that you just don't realize. So all those things uh, that you have to become accustomed to, I put those in one category. That's the natural realm. Well, then, and you can anticipate a lot of those, and some, but there are going to be surprises. And then there's uh, the spirit aspect, spiritual preparation. And you can sort of um, realize that. I mean, you're going to be a missionary, which means that, you know, you're, you're an overseer. You're... You, you know, you have a huge responsibility. Uh, I, I, I can't describe to you what it feels like to have the, the, the weight of the responsibility for a nation with 106 million souls. You know, it's, it's our responsibility to reach them with the gospel, all of them, okay? And so, you know, uh, that's overwhelming when I think about it, it and, 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 and it makes me want to just kind of crumble, but uh, I, I realize this is, this is God's work, 
And, and if he's called us to it, he'll, he'll also show us what needs to be done. So, uh, but you're going to be under attack. You know, you, you, are, the, you are the bullseye. Uh, so you're going to face uh, uh, oppositions and temptations and, and, and struggles that are at a higher level than what you've probably ever faced prior. So there's spiritual preparation. But, but the one that people, uh, I think, tend to miss is that there's another level, and that's emotional preparation. And this is the one that is the least, is given the least consideration, just, just observing missionaries through the years and experiencing it us, uh, you know, uh, in our family a couple times. You, can, you realize that the natural, the stuff in the natural realm, you just deal with that. The spiritual stuff, you, you pray and, and you, you, know, you study and you, you, know, you, you, pray, some, you pray more and, and, you, and you cope with that. Um, and you know that's coming. But it's the emotional part that if, it's, if something's going to knock you out of being a missionary or actually in the ministry, it's probably not going to be you know, the difficulties in the natural realm or the spiritual realm but it's going to be the emotional stuff. Dealing with people, dealing with disappointments, you know, the, the fact that you, you win one, then you lose them. You know, the, the, the attendance is up, then it's down. You, you know, somebody you were putting hopes in, knifes you in the back. Um, uh, and then, then you're lonely. It's so incredibly, you know, you, you're, you're half a world away, you know, and you're, in our case, we're, we're, we're separated from, uh, our, our daughter, maybe half the time or a little bit more than that. And, and uh, you know, we miss her, you know, you miss, her, you miss your family dearly. Um, you're going to, if you're in, on the mission field long term, you can't just come back um, for things that we take for granted. Your parents get, are getting older. You're not, you may not be there to, to, to tend to, to their needs. Uh, you're going to miss weddings. You're going to miss funerals. You're going to miss graduations. You're you're, 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 you know, you're, a lot of things you just take for granted. You're not going to be able to fly back halfway around the country. And so it, it's those emotional things that are the greatest challenges. And uh, um, you, just, you just need God's grace. And this is one of the reasons why when missionaries say, we appreciate your prayers, we, we need your prayers, it's, it's these kinds of areas that really prayer helps fill in the, it strengthens us. It fills in the gaps. I've heard missionaries say that's, that's one of the reasons they love having ministers come over and fellowship just because they feel so isolated. Yeah. And even you think, well, it's a modern world. We have FaceTime and stuff. But in reality, when you've been separated for a long time, it, I hate FaceTime. It just makes the longing worse when I can see you. And then if I look at something like, I look at my, um, I hate to admit it, but I look at my, like my mother-in-law's face and, and, Careful. and I see like the, you know, she like, like the hurt, she misses us. And I'm like, oh, I long for that. You know, it, it makes your heart hurt more. So I, so we don't, we don't FaceTime. And we just, because it hurts to see the look on your face, the, 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 I miss you look and we can't touch. We can't kind of like COVID-19 can't hug, can't do sort of like. Have an <laughs> online church for two months. Yeah. Um, so I'll try for twelve years. So. Yeah. so, so now you're in the Philippines. Yeah. Talk to us about the the work there, yeah. what it's like, uh, the people, the church, uh, your vision, needs, and just just talk okay. to us about the Philippines. Well, first of and all, then we'll transition to home. Philippines are the greatest. It's a it's it's a dream assignment uh, for anybody. I could I can't believe that this was like an open assignment uh, that nobody had jumped on it before us. Because friendliest people in the whole world, and I want to say, uh, just recognize Sister Grace. It was so wonderful uh, having just a, a chance to catch up with her. We had actually met over the phone uh, several months back, uh, trying to give her directions to a couple of our churches. And then I got to meet her tonight. And just, just seeing her tonight um, uh, gladdens my heart because I miss, I miss the folks back home so much. Um, because they are so sweet. Filipinos are just this, the most, uh, I think, probably the most loving, sweet people. Um, and uh, receptive, uh, by and large, receptive to the gospel. Um, I, what was the first part of the question? Just, uh, what, just describe the country, the okay. work, the churches. Okay, the, okay. so the, the countries, okay, so, uh, 
country is halfway around the world, 7,100 islands, uh, 106 million people, uh, probably 80% Catholic. Um, that is probably declining slowly. There's a lot of dissatisfaction with the Catholic Church now because Filipino society is so strong on family, and so the, the scandals within, in, in the uh, priesthood have really soured a lot of people, which is actually good for, for uh, reaching them with the truth. Uh, one of the great things about the Filipino people is that they have a tremendous respect for the Bible. They do recognize it as God's word. Uh, sadly, most of them have never read it, but it, uh, you know, one way we've opened up a lot of conversations is you know, I'm, you, people say, well, I'm, you, I'm Catholic, and I'll say, that's great. So you believe the Bible's God's word? And they say, oh, yes. And I said, would it would be all right if I share with you, uh, you know, some, some thoughts out of God's word, the Bible? And, and, and almost always they'll say yes. So um, they have respect for the word of God, which you don't see that so much in America anymore. So we have some great advantages there. Um, the ALJC had, had been there since the 19. Uh, 50s, actually. Grants. Missionary Grant went there in, I think, 56 or 7 and uh, established an amazing work there. But he died in 95. Uh, the work split in a lot of different directions. And um, when we got there in 2006, when we first visited, there were, it, it kind of dwindled down to where there were 30 licensed ministers and 20 churches. And they were really... Uh, just very, very eager for us to come and just help, you know, help them uh, get things back on a good track. The, the good thing is that they were already well-established in the apostol apostolic faith, very zealous. They just needed some kind of encouraging and a little bit of guidance. By God's grace, we've seen that work now uh, more than triple. I think we have and, more or less 130 ministers and 73 churches now. Awesome. Um, praise the Lord. That's right. God be the glory. Amen. Amen. And so, so talk to us about um, your vision for the work there, uh, some of the needs, how we can be involved, and then also talk to us about Hong Kong and okay. the work there. All right. So, uh, you know, there's nothing like showing up in a country after all that anticipation. You, you know, you've been thinking about it for years and but then the day finally arrives. You show up with your, you, you arrive in the country that God's called you. You're there with your wife. You've already made, you, you know, we sold our house again, second time for us, and uh, got rid of, get rid of your pets. That's one of the hardest things, by the way. And, um, you know, put, puts most of your stuff in long-term storage. And there we were with four suitcases. So we're, we're here. And so I don't know what would be running through your mind, but for us, uh, there was just one question running through my mind at that point, and it's simply, now what? You know, you're here. So, um, what do you do? So we I'll tell you what we we did is we 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 set out first of all to, to visit all the works that, that were already there, and and just listen to the pastors, try to s see where they lived, get their heartbeat, and try to s get their ideas on what you know what. Uh, what the work needed, but we also sought God earnestly during that time, and uh, during that process, God spoke to us. He really gave me a three-part vision. I mentioned it in the video, um, it, 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 it comes from the standpoint, if our job is to really, it really is to reach a nation of 106 million people, how are we going to do it? The first thing that became clear is that there's no way that we can do it by ourselves. If we're really going to reach this nation, we're going to need to train up thousands of national workers to take the gospel to their own people. So training and developing new workers is number one. And uh, this is why we put most of our energies now into that very thing, um, our Bible school and, and doing training seminars. Training, you know, so so it's, it's training all the time. So we spend typically five days a week, uh, five hours a day in class and a couple hours in preparation time um, every week, uh, training young people. And then on weekends, we're traveling to visit our churches, so we're on the go most of the time. Uh, number two, uh, it's planting more churches. So uh, you can't really plant churches, though, if you don't have workers equipped to pastor and oversee those works. So you got to train workers first, and then it seems like, okay, now you feel like, well, if I, if I have all these workers, we'll have this re reservoir of people that are qualified. But it seems like, 
faster than we can train up workers. God is opening more doors, and we need more workers. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. But uh, because of the fact that, that we have workers available, we were able to establish uh, more churches. So in the time we've been there, by God's grace, and with the help of many folks like yourself, we've been able to build 61 churches in the Philippines, and most of those are being pastored. Well, some of those were buildings that were uh, for the pastors who are already there, but many of, the, many of those are now being pastored by uh, graduates of our Bible school. Um, so the third part of the vision, and this is the part that I didn't see coming, was that God has, has in mind that the mission that was once what was once a mission field, that it would become a missionary launching pad. And, and you know, Asia is the most under-evangelized region of the world. And it, it staggers me but to, to, to realize that 60% of the entire world's population is on that one continent. Do you know what, what, what percentage of the, of the world's population the United States is? Anybody? Want to venture a guess? What percent? Between three and four. So less than 4% of the world's population is in the United States. 60% of the world's population is in the 50 countries of Asia. And you'd be hard-pressed to find 40 missionaries, apostolic missionaries, in all of that. Four and a half billion souls and maybe 30, 40 apostolic missionaries in all of Asia. So folks, the need is great. In, in Asia. Um, so uh, God, God showed us that, you know, that his eventual plan is that the mission work would mature so that one day we'll be sending missionaries out of the Philippines to reach the rest of Asia and beyond. And so in the video, you said that, uh, that you've sent someone to Melbourne, Australia? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Out of Brother Nino's church, Brother, okay. Brother Ricky yeah. Ponhe and his family have been there since 2012. That work was kind of slow getting off the ground, but in the last two years, it's really blossomed. He's running about 25 to 30 in church, and they're beginning to baptize new converts now. And so I, in, in our conversation earlier, and we're veering off, the, off, off mm. the plan a little bit, but you, you told me about works needing, needing help in Myanmar, Malaysia, and Japan. Open doors there? Yeah, doors are opening all over Asia. Our biggest struggle is just being able to get to where these open doors are. Uh, Jesus said it, Luke 10, 2, if somebody wants to put it up on the screen. Uh, the greatest need of our hour is that there would be labors. So what do we lack? It's, he said, therefore, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are what? Few. You know, Jesus only made one prayer request that I find in the Bible. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into the harvest. The greatest need, I uh, appreciate giving. That, that's, we need, you know, that, that's always a need. Um, but the greatest need of our hour is for people who are willing to give up their time and their efforts to reach the lost. The harvest is wide open. Um, so... These doors, um, uh, some of those were established works. So you mentioned Myanmar. We have some, uh, we've made contacts with uh, established works where there are national pastors and organizations already in place that could greatly benefit and, 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 and be encouraged by regular visits from missionaries and people who are equipped to train and do seminars. Um, Myanmar is one such place. Um, Nepal is one such place. Thailand is one such place. All of these have apostolic churches that are already connected to the ALJC, but they could sure use some more, uh, you know, more contact. They seems like every time we're able to go, uh, we see just, you know, just. Uh, a great, you know, they're, they're greatly encouraged. The, the works are buoyed, uh, and usually for weeks afterwards, they're experiencing revival just because we came and spent a few days and taught some seminars. But if somebody could just get to those areas, if you know, if there was a missionary that could maybe visit here for a couple of weeks, go here for a couple of weeks, and go there for a couple of weeks, 
and maybe uh, you know the opportunity for a circuit riding kind of ministry is certainly possible there. Um, some of the other ones you, you mentioned are, are places where there is no work, but there's an invitation to come. We have uh, a, a brand new door opened up in Indonesia out of Brother Sanguenza's church, uh, a young man, brand new convert. He says, you need to come and, and, and preach this to my village. Oh, how I want to go. So we're making arrangements. This right, just right as COVID was coming, you know, I, uh, we're making arrangements for Brother Sanguenza to go and minister there. Um, it, it's, we have a similar opportunity in Malaysia, another one in Japan where we haven't even been able to get there. So talk to us a little bit about the work in Hong Kong. That's, that's uh, perhaps our newest work, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, all right, so the, the, really excited about Hong Kong. Um, uh, for those who may not know, Hong Kong is the uh, financial uh, center of Asia. It's like the New York City of Asia. So it's a very prosperous, very, very wealthy kind of city. And it's, it's unusual in that though it's part of China, it, it used to be separate because it was a British colony for 156 years. And that ended in the year 1997 when the, the Chinese refused to renew any kind of lease. So they took, China back, they took Hong Kong back under Chinese control. But the Chinese are, are not stupid. They realized that that Hong Kong is very prosperous and they didn't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. So they made an arrangement with the, the people of Hong Kong that uh, they call it two, uh, one nation, two systems. So they allow Hong Kong a, a much greater degree of, of, of freedom than uh, they do elsewhere. So um, there is freedom of religion there, although it is not as free as it is here. Religious societies have to be registered. Uh, but they went through a period of time where they weren't registering. Actually, they haven't been registering very many societies at all. Uh, but God made a way, uh, miraculously, to get us registered there. But the way that it got started is it's it's exciting. Uh, when we were there in 2000, in, in Manila, in 2006 or 7, I think it was 2007, um, had the honor of baptizing a, la a young lady, single mom, uh, who later just became a real zealous soul winner. Sister Emily is her name. Um, and uh, eventually she took a, a job in Hong Kong so that she could make enough money to, to send back to, to support her family. And a lot of people do that. There's actually 200,000 uh, Filipinos, almost all women, living in Hong Kong who send their money back to the Philippines. And anyway, so she's there in Hong Kong and uh, she... She just keeps winning souls. So, so she's there for a long time, but she's meeting people. She's teaching Bible studies. And, and uh, it seems like all of a sudden she's got one, then two, then three that want to get baptized. So I made arrangements with Pastor Allen to, to make an exploratory trip to see what was going on. And uh, we were just amazed to see just how not only what she had done, but what God was preparing there. Um, so we, after the first trip, we realized we, we, you know, there's an opportunity to start a work here. Now, I believe God's long-term vision for Hong Kong is, you know, right now it's, it's Filipinos that, that were, uh, the work's getting started with, but uh, looking for the day when that will cross over and we'll begin to, to, to win some, some Chinese, English-speaking Chinese who can then minister to Chinese-speaking Chinese. Amen. So... We're, we're going to bring this, this portion to a close. I'm going to give you a, a, a segment of time here just to, to talk to our church, whatever's on your heart, about the work, about the need, whatever, whatever the Lord has on your heart. Talk to our church, and then when you're done, uh, we'll stop our, our live feed. Anyone who needs to go can go, but if anyone wants to stay and ask more questions, uh, you're welcome to do so. So I'm going to give you the floor Thank you, Pastor. just to... Uh, to share your heart for a moment. Thank you, Pastor. Well, um, first of all, let me, I, I will talk a little bit about the needs. There are uh, really uh, five great needs I could put, put before you today. Uh, number one, uh, and this, this may be the biggest bang for your buck, uh, would be supporting a Bible college student, sponsoring a Bible college student, because it all starts there. Uh, we, you know, we can't, you know, if you don't have workers, don't have preachers, don't have ministers, um, the gospel's not going to be preached. So uh, 
we, we've got an established Bible school. It's a one-year program. Um, but during that period of time, uh, there's a need to, to feed them, house them, you know, take care of their basic necessities. The good news is we don't charge any tuition. It, it's, it's, uh, so, so, so we make it as easy as possible for the young people to come. But we do have to take care of those expenses. It only costs about $100 a month to take care of one student's needs for an entire month. So it's cheap there. Um, but that, that's the greatest need. And why I say it's the greatest bang for your buck is that some of these are going to go on and win hundreds of souls. You know, some of our young uh, graduates are already pastoring two and three churches. They're only out of Bible school for a few years. And, and we, we've got one that's already not only uh, established a Bible, uh, a daughter church, but that daughter church is now establishing a church. So, I mean, there, you know, things are happening, but it all starts with, uh, with, with the Bible school. So that's number one. Number two, uh, and this is obviously a bigger ticket item, but... Um, Sponsoring the building of a church. Now, we can build churches in the remote areas out of light materials, bamboo and, and light materials. Uh, $2,000 actually builds a, a nice building. It can seat 30 or 40 people. You know, it might be bamboo and wood with a, with a galvanized steel roof and a concrete floor, but $2,000 will get that done. And you know, we're always having opportunities to do that. Um, little by little, though, we are, we're trying to replace those lightweight buildings with more sturdy buildings made out of concrete and steel, which hold up to the termites and the typhoons uh, much better. Um, but we can build a solid uh, uh, 30 by 30 building that will seat over 100 people. Uh, now, it won't be finished out like this. It'll just be you know, a roof over their heads, concrete, and, and some walls, and then we'll let them finish it you beautify it over time. But we can get that structure up for between eight and $10,000, depending upon the location. So that's number two. Uh, um, let's see, I have a list. Um, so number three is give monthly to missions, whatever you can, just through your church. And, you know, you might say, well, I don't have a lot to give. I can't, you know, can't do that much. Um, folks, it, it, just do what you can. Um, you know, a, a dollar here, five dollars there, 10, you know, 10, 20 once in a while. Uh, it doesn't seem like much, but when everybody's doing that across a church and across an organization, it adds up. And that's really what fuels all of our missions works is the monthly giving. So monthly support is huge. Um, number four, give yourself to the work. You know, the greatest thing you could do is, is just... Uh, Invest yourself into missions and, and uh, uh, get involved. If you're not already actively involved somewhere in the kingdom, reaching for souls, doing the work of, of evangelism, what are you waiting for? Get out there, get out there and do it. And uh, number five, pray. Pray for your missionaries because we need that and uh, we feel it. I, I, we literally see your prayers and feel them round about us all the time. And I'm gonna tell you, sometimes when we just need it the most, I'll just feel a wave of glory and realize, I didn't pray that down, somebody's praying for me, thank God. Um, and then there's, th those are the five that, that would always be there, but th we have one um, other pressing need of the hour, and that is uh, related to this COVID-19 crisis. Now, here in America, I heard pastor, I won't say how many pounds you said you gained, but uh, uh, we're all fighting the battle of the bulbs, right? Because we've been home and, and, uh, and, and not working and, um, you know, less active than normal. But it's not like that in the Philippines. Um, it, it, it's important, I think, for people to realize they don't have the, the safety net there. Most people in good times, normal times, the average Filipino makes between $5 and $10 a day. That's his normal wage, and somehow they're, you know, they're taking care of their families on that meager amount of money. But they've all been out of work, almost all of them, for two months, okay? And government help is scarce to, to, to non-existent, depending upon where you are. And a lot of people there are suffering real hunger. And honestly, I'm, 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 I, I don't, I'm not exaggerating when I'm worried about starvation. It's, it's that bad. 
So we have been doing everything that we can do to raise funds, and people have responded to our appeals on Facebook and social media and, and every, everywhere I'm going. Uh, and so far, we've been able to send about $10,000 over to the Philippines in, in little batches um, that are, I'm so proud of our pastors because they are, I'm sending it to our, our trusted leaders there. They, in turn, are, are sending it out to other pastors. And if you go on our Facebook page, you'll see hundreds upon hundreds of pictures of, of them handing out food packs. And what a tremendous witness this is of the love of Christ in those communities. And Pastor Nino shared something with me today. Since COVID-19 began, he's baptized 37 souls in Jesus' name. And a lot of those were people that have received this, just, just food help. They're so touched by the fact that we're reaching out to them to feed them. They see the love of God in that. So uh, that's an immediate right now need. Um, it'll probably pass. You know, I'm hoping within a few weeks it'll pass. But the lockdowns have been extended in Luzon and also in, in Davao City uh, up to the end of the month, up to May 31. So you, you all realize what a, an ordeal it's been for us, but it's really been a crisis for them. Amen. Thank you, Brother Naomi, for being with us. We're going to do a couple of things. In a moment, I'm going to have you pray over our church. Wow. And while he's praying over our church, I want you to pray for him oh, wow. and the work there. But Brother Danny and, and, uh, and Brother Daniel... If you'll grab each of you an offering pan and position by the doors, when we dismiss, when, when he's done praying, uh, we're going to stop the live feed. Those of you that need to go, you, you can go. Uh, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to give for this need that he just talked Praise about. God. Thank you, Lord. And so um, whatever the Lord lays on your heart, you can give it as you go. If you want to write a check, if you, uh, you want to make a pledge, you can do that. And we'll get that to Sister Joanna, and we'll try to make sure that we help you remember that. Um, but, but you can give to that specific need number six on your way out. If you want to stay and ask a few more questions, Brother Naomi agreed earlier to, to hang around. If you, want to, if you want to talk to him, if you have a question we didn't ask about anything relating to life in, in ministry, in the mission field, whatever, uh, you can do that. He'll, he'll hang around here. And then uh, when I get hungry, I'll tell you all it's over, and me and him are going to go across the street and eat. So, um, but that's what we're going to do. So, Brother Naomi, uh, while they're preparing back there, I want to ask you to pray over our church family, those that are watching online, those that are here. And then while he's doing that, if you will, will you please pray for our pastors and, uh, and our work in the Philippines and, and brother and sister Naomi and their daughter Sarah. God bless you, sir. I'm going to stand if you all want to join me. Lord. Lord, I thank you today for this wonderful church, God, that's been here for now 75 years, God, standing for apostolic truth. God, I thank you for the heritage and the foundation of this church. Thank you, God, for the ministries that have come out of this work. I thank you, God, for the evangelists and the pastors that have already gone out. Of, of, this, of this work. I thank you, God, for the families, God, that are here, the ones that support and, and, and strengthen this church. I pray, God, for your blessings to be upon Bethlehem Church. I pray, oh God, that you help them to do more, God, for you than they even dream that they can do. God, I believe this is a key church. God, a key congregation in your, in your plan, Lord. I pray, God, for the ministry of this church, for Pastor Vasquez and Sister Sarah. I pray, oh God, for his daughters. I pray, God, for the Wilsons and, God, all the ministers and helps, God, that are here. I pray, God, that you strengthen their hands. I pray, oh God, for an anointing to come. God, that, and strengthen, God, continued wisdom. God, to lead your people. God, this is an age, God, where God, we're encountering things, God, that we have not yet encountered before. Lord, if we ever need your direction, if we ever need your unction, if we ever need to see clearly, Lord, we need to see clearly now. Help, oh God, us prepare our hearts, God, to enter into this phase, oh God, of the church. We know, Lord, you've got your hands upon your church. We know, God, I pray for comfort for those, God, who are uneasy. God, I come against the spirit of fear 
here, God, that has gripped so many hearts. God, I pray, Lord, for revival. I thank you, God, for the spirit of revival that's already here. I feel revived in my own spirit. I thank you, God, for the decades of prayer, God, that have saturated this place. I pray, oh God, for more prayer warriors to be, God, to be strengthened and, and brought up from this congregation. Oh, God, expand our reach. Expand the reach of this church. God, around the world. God, it's Pastor Vasquez's dream, oh God, that God, we've already seen God evangelists. We've already seen pastors come out of here, great men and women of God, but it's this man of God's vision, Lord. God, that missionaries would come out, God, of this, of this assembly. God, let missionary works, God. God, let missionaries be birthed from this ministry, oh God. I thank you for my brother. I'm asking, oh God, for you to strengthen him and encourage him, oh God. God, we thank you, God, for his passion for your word and his passion for your work. God, help him, oh God, God, to minister to evil even more. God, to do more than he can dream to do. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Strengthen his hands. Strengthen his spirit. Anoint his ministry, Lord. And we thank you, God, and praise you, Lord, for these sayings. We give you the praise and glory. Let's praise him together. Oh, let's lift up our voices to the King of Kings. God is so good. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.